Sonny Mariti, Vigion Libida Paneha Donai, Surriva Goali. May the words of my mouth and thoughts of my heart be acceptable before you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Shalom all and welcome. I am your host, Ariel Bartit Sadok. You find me online at koshatara.com. Now I've titled this course An Orthodox Rabbi Reads the Christian Bible. My purpose and intent in teaching this course is simple. I want to be able to explain why Torah Judaism and Torah faithful Jews do not and will not accept or embrace the teachings of the Christian religion. I have no intentions or desire in this course to attack the religion of Christianity. I am not here to challenge or critique those who embrace the Christian faith. I am not here to talk about Christianity at all. Even though due to the nature of this material, I am sure that I will not be able to avoid the topic entirely. Nevertheless, I am here to look at the Christian Bible from an entirely Torah point of view. I begin with certain premises. I do not deny the existence of an historical Yeshu, be it called Yeshua or what. For Torah faithful Jews, Yeshu was not, is not, and can never be the Messiah of Israel. For Torah faithful Jews, Yeshu was not, is not, and can never be God, or even a son of God, any more than any other human being of flesh and blood. For the record, the historical Yeshu was born, lived as, and died as a Jew. He and his original followers were all Jews who, like him, were born, lived as, and died as Jews. Absolutely none of them were Christians in any sense of the word. We Torah faithful Jews follow the same religion that Yeshu himself practiced. We pray to the same Heavenly Father. We live by the same Torah, Mitzvot, and Maasim Tobim. Yeshu was not a Christian, neither are we. Yeshu's original followers were all Torah observant Jews, as was he. As Jews educated in Torah, drenched in its teachings, and from what can be seen, knowing no other spiritual path, I must logically conclude that the original writings of Yeshu's original followers were old Jewish writings, and therefore well within my domain as a Torah observant rabbi to read them and understand them as would one rabbi to another. I therefore begin with the position that anything found in the Christian Bible attributed to any of its Jewish authors that does not agree with Torah Judaism must not have been written by such an author, and is therefore subject to suspicion and must be critically analyzed. That's what I'm here to do. Like many Torah sages before me, I do not accept Talmudic Midrash about Yeshu at face value. Those teachings are meant to be polemic, not historical. Therefore, they will not be part of our discussions. Now, I've been led to perform this work because of the experiences in my personal life. As a teenager, I was victimized by a terrible evangelical group in my hometown on Long Island. This group was led by a very evil, lying, deceitful individual who turned out to also be a pedophile. I am thankful that I was able to escape being victimized in that way. Nevertheless, this individual sought to clandestinely place his minions in Orthodox Yeshivot in Israel to get them to learn about Judaism with the attempt to make it easier for them to persuade Jews to convert and join their fold. I fought long and hard against this group. And I'm proud of my contributions in thwarting their efforts. It was through them and because of them that I became exposed to Christianity. I've therefore devoted the last 40 years of my life to study and investigation to discover whatever of the truth that is still out there to be discovered. And now, after 40 years, I feel confident and ready to share my insights and discoveries with you. So again, I reiterate, I am not here to attack our God-fearing Bible-believing Christian neighbors. I hold them in the highest esteem and respect. I am here to explain to you, to them, and all willing to listen, what we to our faithful Jews see when we read the Christian Bible, and why we see what we do. And now, let us proceed with tonight's lesson. Alrighty, we are in lesson 19 in this series. My how time flies when we're having fun. We're in chapter 26. We're getting now to the discussion of Yeshu's betrayal, his arrest. We're going to discuss in this class the, in quote, Last Supper. And we are now entering into what, in my opinion, is probably one of the most controversial, possibly convoluted sections of the entire record of the life of Yeshu. In order to discuss much of this material, not so much in tonight's class, but next week's class, we get into the trial, crucifix, and resurrection. I'm going to have to go into a lot of Christian scholarship 
because Christian scholars know and recognize that there are a lot of scholarly problems with regards to the Christian scriptural record. There are just so many inconsistencies, improbabilities, strange records, which laymen reading the story, they accept it at face value, simply because, like, good Bible-believing, you know, God-fearing people, they don't know any better, they don't believe they believe. But scholars, scholars don't look at things blindly. They take off the blinders and they look at things. And what they see troubles them. Now, needless to say, the number of Jewish scholars dealing with these issues are few. Granted, they are out there, but they're still few in number. Christian scholarship, on the other hand, in these issues is very involved. And we're going to have to look at these matters in the light of scholarship. And obviously in the light of Torah. Because when we get into things... We're going to have to be scholarly critical in analyzing things and looking at things. Are we going to be able to draw definitive and absolute conclusions? No, because I don't think you can draw definitive absolute conclusions about anything. But we are going to raise a tremendous number of questions. We are going to have to look at things that from a Christian theological position is going to be very uncomfortable from their doctrinal standings. But, I mean, that's what scholarship is all about. We're obviously not here to attack anyone's faith. People should believe whatever they want to believe. As long as their behavior is decent and righteous, we, we don't argue doctrine or theology. But with that note, we're going to go into chapter 26 now, as I said. And now we're going to find what for me are some strange stories, details of which, as you will see, we have to address. So, chapter 26 opens with the benign words, and it came to pass when Yeshua had finished all these sayings, those which we covered in our previous classes, he says to his disciples, Know ye that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. That's the King James reading of that. And two days to Pesach. Now, let's put things into a little bit of a context. According to the standard Christian understanding of things today, Yeshu was allegedly crucified on a Friday afternoon, which was supposedly the Yom Tov, or the first day of Pesach, and he arose from the dead before the rising of the sun on Sunday morning. And according to Christian theology, he was dead for three days and three nights. Now, I don't care how you want to twist and turn and turn and twist things. You cannot fit three days and three nights from a Friday afternoon to a Sunday morning before sunrise. It just doesn't fit. Can you look at it, say, from a Thursday? Well, let's look at it. If, let's just, for argument's sake, say that the story is what it is. Let's say he died 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. You have the rest of Thursday, day 1. Friday day, day 2. Saturday day, day 3. Thursday night, night 1. Friday night, night 2. Saturday night, night 3. You could have it. It could fit. Okay? So therefore, if the crucifixion was real, we'll discuss more about this later, it would have to have been on a Thursday. So now, if he is saying that the Feast of Passover is on a Thursday, which I don't think that's what he's saying, then he would have been saying this on a Tuesday. But, I would think that he's referring actually to Erev Pesach, where the day before Passover might have been then two days later, which would have been then for a Wednesday, which means he's talking now on a Monday. Why is all of this important? Because here's one of those problems that I was talking to you about. If the Christian tradition wants to state that Yeshu was actually crucified on 
a holiday? A Yom Tov? Inconceivable. Impossible. In spite of all the twists and turns in the crucifixion story, there has never been, to the best of my knowledge, a historical event of any kind of activity of this kind on a Yom Tov. It just would not have happened. Now why is this important? Because it puts, as we are going to see from verse 26 when we get there, the concept of the Lord's Supper into a context. You see, in modern Christianity, those who are trying to reach out to Judaism, they are interpreting, in quote, the Lord's Supper to being a Passover Seder. And that is just historically impossible. Now, some people will say, well, he wasn't doing it like the Pharisees, he was doing it like the Essenes. I don't care if he was doing it like the Martians. It doesn't matter. Not even the Essenes observed their Passover a, a day before. If anything, it would have been observed, it would have, the issue of observance would have been uh, on other holidays. Passover, everybody agreed with you. They had the full moon. Right? That's what Passover was. So, Erev Pesach. So, Erev Pesach would have been the day of maybe the crucifixion if, if, if it really did happen that way. Which means that the, he would have been arrested the night before Erev Pesach or Erev Erev Pesach, which therefore puts this Lord's Supper, if you will, again before the holiday. And that's the context. So when he's saying here that it's two days to the Feast of Passover, is he talking about a Monday, where in which he's got 48 hours to the day before, or not? You see, other scholars, not just myself, I'm going to talk about Christian scholars here, look into this text and suspect, if you will, shall we say, an editing hand, where in which in order to make things theologically or doctrinally correct might have changed a word or two here and there. And when he says that in two days is the Feast of Passover, might have said originally the dawn of or the Eder Feast. So that's how we understand this. Now, the Son of Man, notice he didn't say me, myself, meaning Yeshu says, he's saying the Son of Man. Because he's referring to himself in the apocalyptic setting of being the supernatural Messiah. And then he says to be crucified. Well, remember, in those days, Jews were crucified in large number. Indeed, Yeshu himself echoed this many a time before, if you remember from previous classes, where he says, those who want to follow, let them pick up their crosses and follow him. That's a Jewish statement. It has nothing to do with Christianity. It meant martyrdom. It meant what we say in Hebrew today, Kiddush Hashem. A sacrifice for God's name. Dying for the cause. Which in those days, Jews died by the hundreds if not thousands. Yes, the cross was originally a Jewish symbol of martyrdom before it ever became a Christian symbol of salvation. Essentially, the cross in Judaism might have had the same symbolic intent as a tattooed number from Auschwitz. That's what it meant. It was a sign of sacrifice. So, this, or these words, look suspicious to me. Why? Because if you remember throughout this entire course, I have been sharing to you based upon the teachings of both Torah sages and a number of Christian scholars that Yeshu was intentionally planning an armed insurrection for the sake of overthrowing Roman government and the institution, I should say, the reinstitution of the Davidic monarchy. And it is alleged in many a circle, and we will discuss this in future classes, we will discuss Yu Schoenfeld's book. We'll discuss uh, the Holy Blood, Holy Grail beliefs that the entire crucifixion was a conceived plot and plan on Yeshu's part. 
with the specific intent to falsify, if you will, a crucifixion, falsify a resurrection so as to give the appearance of a supernatural Messiah firing up his movement for greater fervor. And again, this is not unique to my views. You will find much of this in Christian scholarship as well. So ancient are these ideas and beliefs that they are actually even incorporated in the Quran. That's right. Muhammad back in the 7th century, in the 600s, got these ideas, obviously, from those Jews and Christians living in Arabia at the time, who, according to most understandings historically, were possibly the last remnants of the original historical Nazarene or Ebionite communities of Jerusalem, the original Jewish followers of Yeshu, who continued the original teachings those which were not pilfered and changed and altered by the Gentile Catholic Church. So, when we look at things in that context, we see a very different picture. But moving right along. Those that assembled together, he says here, he says, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was Caiaphas, consulted that they might take Yeshu by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not at the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. Now, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders of the people, notice a group glaringly absent. Where is the mention? of the Pharisees. Not there. You see, the rabbis, the true Pharisees, would never have acted in this way. As Torah faithful Jews, even if Yeshu was the most overt, violent, and dangerous rebel, they would have responded and acted with him within the context of Jewish law. They would never have turned to non-Torah authorities. Do you know, to this very day, it is written in the Code of Jewish Law, section Hoshim Mishpat, in the Laws of Judges, a law dating back to biblical times, that it is forbidden for two Jews to go to secular court and to submit themselves to secular legal jurisprudence, unless, of course, Jewish legal jurisprudence has proven unsuccessful or is, is inappropriate. In other words, you have to go to the bit din before you can go to secular court. And not doing so makes either party, in the words of the law, rashaim, wicked, evil, bad. That's the law. It was the law in those days when Yeshua was alive. It was the law to this day too. Now, I'm not going to get into comments of modern politics and modern bet-dins or anything of the kind. That's another story. But the Pharisees of the day would never have sought to have Yeshua, a fellow Jew, good or bad, subject to non Torah authority or punishment even if that non-Torah authority be secular Jewish so who are these priests or scribes or elders of the people the palace of the high priest Caiaphas who the heck was he he was an authority not an authority and according to the Torah for those who are not familiar in the days of the second temple the high priesthood was comprehensively compromised. It was not an authoritative office. The people who were high priests in the days of the Second Temple were often considered unacceptable, were suspect of being apostate. So much is this true that to this very day for those of you who are familiar with the Yom Kippur service, the Day of Atonement prayers, there is a section there which outlines the, the uh, uh, service of the Temple in the Second Temple times. It's called Seder HaAvodah, the Order. This is a very important 
prayer, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. But right at the beginning, it states that days before the Yom Kippur, the sages would approach the high priest. And they would make him take a vow that he would follow every letter to the detail of what they teach him because their atonement depended upon him. And it says the sages would turn and cry and the high priest would turn and cry. The sages would turn and cry because they had to suspect the high priest of not being legitimate. And the high priest would turn and cry because he was subject to being suspect. That is what's written in the Seder Avodah. A recitation which to this very day is recited every Yom Kippur. Now, like Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. There's an interesting little detail about this Seder Avodah. Who is its author? Who wrote it? There is an old opinion that states that the author of the Seder Avodah was a very curious character known as Shimon Kippa or Shimon Kefa. Now I've discussed this way back at the beginning of our class. And I'll share with you my history of knowledge. I was once learning a great holy book called Sefer Chassidim, the book of the pious written by Rabbi Yehuda HaChassid. Um, and in it, there is a section about cursing the wicked. And it says, yeah, when people are overtly wicked, it, it, it's not a sin to curse them, with the exception of people like Shimon Kefa. At the time, I said, well, who is this Shimon Kefa? I, I never heard of him. And I read in the footnotes and the commentary, it said, oh, he is believed by some to be the author of this Seder Avodah. I said, okay, I get that. Why then would he be cursed? And then I read the legend. You see, according to the teachings, Shimon Kefa was a member of the Sanhedrin in the days of Yeshu. And as Yeshu's movement was growing in strength and power, and the sages were growing in fear because of its violent, bloodthirsty nature, they addressed the issue what to do. And Shimon Kefa came forth and said, I have an idea of how we can neutralize their violent tendencies. I will infiltrate the movement and spew out teachings which will spiral them away from Judaism and the Torah. But I do so on condition that my, if you will, guise of apostasy will not be taken seriously and that you will never curse my name and my self-sacrifice. And the sages agreed that this would be the best course of action. And with their blessing, Shimon Kefa went forth. Who is Shimon Kefa? Well, for those of you who know the Hebrew, it would translate as Simon Peter. But yet, it couldn't have been Simon Peter of the Gospels. However, it clearly and distinctly fits the description of Paul. Would the Midrash give the name of Shimon Kefa, Simon Peter, as a cover to protect Paul's identity? Oh, absolutely. That's the way the rabbis always did things. That's why when I read this story, I take it so seriously because it sounds so much like what would legitimately have happened. Do you understand what we just said? Is it possible that the Seder Avodah recited by Torah faithful Jews to this day, was actually written by none less than Paul? Isn't that interesting to contemplate? So, that's the line of questioning. That's the line of thought. Deal with it as you wish. We're still left with this very problematic issue of these non-Torah authorities conspiring against Yeshu. They wanted to take him by subtlety, obviously, because if the people, the rank and file people, were God-fearing or Torah observant, whatever level of learning, they would not tolerate an overt violation of the law. So therefore they had to do things subtly. 
So moving right along. It says, Yeshu is in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. It says, they came to him, a woman having an alabaster box of a precious ointment and poured it on his head as they sat to eat. His disciples saw it and they had indignation. What purpose is this waste? The ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. That makes sense. But Yeshua, he said like this, Why trouble you the woman? She has wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but, ye, but me ye have not always. For in that she had poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial? That doesn't sound right. Verily I say, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also be this that this woman hath done, be told a memorial of her. Number one, this doesn't sound like issue. Right? Number two, burial and, and the likes of this from crucifixion, and then put oils and stuff like that. They do things like that. It's not a Jewish practice. This entire story is suspicious because Yeshua as a rabbi would never have said, yeah, go ahead and waste that rather than give it to the poor. Indeed, Yeshua would have been the first one who would have said, you know, give render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And oil, obviously, is of this world. So this entire story told in memorial of this woman, I question. I question the historicity of it. It's not very Jewish. And if Yeshua truly was the rabbi that he was, it doesn't sound like anything he would have done. So, this entire story here, I have a question mark. But moving right along. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. Remember who Judas was. The word Iscariot means Sikari. Sikari was clearly the group known as the Assassins. In Muslim tradition, they would have been the Hashishin. Today, they would have been Al-Qaeda or, or, or a, uh, a Shahid, which is a uh, suicide bar. That was the nature of the Sikari. Yehuda, according to many of the traditions and sources, maybe you have seen a film made many years ago called The Last Temptations of Christ, which portrayed the ancient teaching that Judah... Iscariot, Yehuda HaSikari, was actually Yeshu's most trusted right-hand man, the only one who could be trusted to be on the inside of the conspiracy to create the illusion of a betrayal. Now, this is in accordance to many ancient teachings. So this is the orientation that we're going to take towards this. Known as an irreputable character in the eyes of the secular authorities who have no Torah validity, says to them, what are you going to give me if I deliver him to you? So, bottom line, he makes it very clear that he has an agenda He's not selling him out for political gains. He's asking for some kind of money. So they say the covenant for 30 pieces of silver, which, if you think about it, is rather cheap. Let's just, for argument's say that 30 pieces of silver would be an ounce of silver. Well, if an ounce of silver today goes for, what, $25, $30, right? 30 times 30, 900. You are going to betray your best friend for $900? Good Lord. That's cheap. So something about this story reeks with insincerity. The amount of the bribe is far too little. If Yeshu is such a danger, if indeed he is such a threat and you have an insider willing to betray him, something tells me you would offer more than 900 bucks. When the United States of America was hunting for Osama bin Laden, they put a $25 million bounty on his head. I think that's correct. 
figure. Um, a little bit more than 900 bucks. So therefore, if you want to have a bounty on somebody, the think about it. If you, if, if, if you thought I heard today that the United States of America is out for the number one arch-terrorist, responsible for the death of thousands, and there's a thousand dollar reward on his head, you and I might scratch our heads at thousand dollars? Gee, uh, I mean, that, that's nothing. That's, it, 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 it would almost be an incentive not to turn him in. You would be, as I would be suspicious by the low amount that something was not right. When you look at 30 pieces of silver for what its actual value is, that's what comes across here. But you see, if you don't know the value of silver, you would never think that. So what's going on here? Why would the betrayal be for so cheap? Unless there was some ulterior motive and intent behind it. But it says here, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. But again, according to our understanding was, this was all in conjunction with the issue, with the specific intent to create a scenario so that he could catapult himself into the supernatural position. And in order for this to have been successfully accomplished, it had to be done on a very highly classified need-to-know basis only, which means he would not have told his closest students. He might not even have told his own family. Some people believe that, of course, he was married and had children, and that, indeed, he didn't even tell his own family. So now, here's another issue. It is believed in the Christian tradition that Yeshua at this time is only 33 years old. But yet, according to other scholarly views and beliefs, it's very possible that he literally might have been twice that age. That he might have been a man in his 40s, 50s, even 60s at the time, with already adult-grown children. Because there's an echo throughout the text, as we will see later, that he had adult children, and that he himself possibly thought that if he wasn't going to make it through the insurrection, at least one of his sons would rule in his place. And when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, it does kind of look like that. But now, let's move on. It says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Yeshu, saying to him, What will thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? The order is, 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 is wrong. It says the first day of Passover has come, and then they're going to say, What are we going to eat on the Passover? That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Anybody who knows anything of Judaism knows the day starts at the night. The Passover Seder is done the night before the first day. So the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you're not going to ask what you're going to eat at the Seder because the Seder's already done. They didn't have a Yom Tov Shini in the land of Israel at the time where they were going to worry about a second Seder the second night. Again, this is clear evidence of somebody pilfering with the text. This is just not right. So, could we possibly then say that it was the eve of the first day of the Passover, or a day before, and they would say, what are we going to eat tonight at Seder, because it's Erev Pesach? That too wouldn't make sense, because then that would put his arrest and crucifixion on a holiday, which even the Pharisees themselves said, not on the feast day, lest an uproar be among the people. Even the secular authorities No, you don't mess around with the Yom Tov. So if he's not crucified on the Yom Tov, how is it that it's the first day of the unleavened bread and then they come to him and say, what do we need for the Passover? The order just doesn't make sense here. Everything is confused. A non-Jewish author or editor in this case, not knowing the flow of, of, of Judaism and Torah law, possibly would gaze, glaze over this, not realizing. But those of us who are familiar with Torah reckon, well, well, wait a second. 
you, you got here a flat tire. Things aren't rolling right. Things are just not in proper order. Something's wrong here. Moving right along. It says that Yeshu says, Go into the city to such a man and say to him, Your master says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Well, if he's going to observe the Passover, then automatically this is the day before Passover, not the first day of the feast. Problem. The disciples did as Yeshki had appointed them, and they made ready for Passover. Again, this is a problem for the reasons we described. One second. Excuse me. See, isn't it nice to have live recordings here? You can catch my live sneezing. Anyway, this is the problem. You see, he couldn't have been crucified on a holiday. And therefore, this, in quote, Last Supper, could not have been a Passover Seder. And therefore, for it to say so here is already confusing. It's not the first day of the Eleven Feast. They're not preparing for the Passover, which would have already been done. So how is it that they're making preparation for something that's supposedly already done? Contradictory. Problematic. Anyone who is a scholar from Christian and Jewish circles sees this. Problem here in the text. So, moving right along. So he states here, Now when even they come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say to you, one of you shall betray me. Is this a prophecy? Or is this part of the plan that he's preparing his people? And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Again, every one of them to say, Lord, is it I? And he answered, and he, dipped, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish and shall betray me. Now, this is showing you just a little bit of ancient culture where in which they had a single bowl from which people used to eat. The single bowl used to be some kind of a soup. We'd have the meat and the vegetables and everything, and you would usually have some kind of bread. And you would take it like flatbread. And you would take it and roll it up in there and make some kind of a sandwich out of it. And that was called dipping from the same dish. In many Middle Eastern traditions, to this day, people still eat like that. That's the common way. Then he says here, The Son of Man goeth as it's written of him, but one went to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Again, i got a problem with this text. Because if Yeshu truly was indeed involved in this, his own, uh, what you call it, his own conspiracy, would he have said these words? No. But according to a later redactor, an editor, who is trying to redefine the story, then yes. Being that we clearly have such confusion and contradiction already in just these few verses, the fact that I find this here fits into that confusion and contradiction more than adds clarity to the story. But then they get to Judah, who betrayed him, and he said, The Master said, I, and he said, You have said, Thou hast said. All right? How come he just didn't say yes? How come he didn't point a finger and said, Get him, guys, he's the traitor? Well, ah, Christians said, Well, he needed to be crucified. Well, Yada, yada, yada. Why did he even have to identify? And it says, and now we go into the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Yeshu took bread and blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. All right? This is the beginning of the Christian concept of communion. And then it says he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, this is the blood. All right, we'll get to that in a second. First of all, bread first, wine second, that's not right. Anybody who's Jewish knows that. What comes first, guys? Obviously, wine. Wine is Kiddush. Was Yeshu doing a traditional suda here? If it was Yom Tov, he would be having Kiddush, Right? Right. But the fact says that he had bread first and only later had wine. 
What does that say to anybody who knows anything about Judaism? This was not a Kiddush, which clearly again proves this was not a Yom Tov. Notice it says that he took the bread and blessed it. What is the blessing on bread? Every Jew should know. Ha motzi lechem min ha arts. Yeshu said appropriate bracha. Broke it and gave it to everybody. This is my body. Okay? Now, if indeed he ever said these words, which let the scholars debate, is it physical? According to Catholic belief, if I'm not mistaken, I'm certainly not qualified to represent Catholic theology. I do believe that their views are that somehow in the communion, the wafer and wine are turned into the actual blood, flesh and blood of Yeshu that you eat. Obviously, this has to be understood, if at all, as a symbolic metaphor. You are not being cannibalistic to eat the flesh and blood of any human being. So, to consider it or portray it as such, I'll have to let those theologians deal with those issues. So, the, clear, the proof of the order is that it was not a Kiddush. The proof of the order is that it wasn't yet Yom Tov. So therefore, this was not, not, not a Passover Seder. And it says bread. If indeed it was Passover, why would it have not said matzah? Or you could say, well, maybe the redactor or the editor didn't know. Yes, of course he wouldn't know. But if Matthew the Jew was truly writing this, and it truly was a Jewish writing, written by the Jewish author, he would have known. And he would have written matzah. There's clearly enough evidence of Matthew, the original, knowing enough about Judaism in here, that I would have expected to see that. So again, proof. This is not a Passover Seder. Then he takes the cup, gives thanks. Notice he's saying a baracha. Anybody to this day who knows the law, if and when you recite a motzi lechem in arts, to this very day in Jewish law, there is a question whether or not drinks are included in the blessing of Hamotzi. You can go read about this in Law Codes to this day, like the Benish Hai. You would have indeed said, Bore Pari Ha Gethen, Sparty Bay. All right? And now it says, This is my blood of the New Testament. Oh, 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 stop right there. Where on earth did this come from? Matthew would never have written these words. Yeshua would have never said these words. There is no echo of this anywhere before. This is clearly, read the Christian scholars, clearly the work of a later redactor. Now, of course, the faithful aren't going to believe that. I get that. That's fine. But before you go and yell and scream at me, kill the Jew, kill the Jew, please know that Christian scholars said this, and I'm only taking it from them. I know you're saying, kill the scholars, kill the scholars. So please don't say, kill the Jews, kill the Jews. All right, let's put all this anti-Semitism and, and, and nonsense behind us or aside, please. All right. The New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Uh, again, my mind just explodes. Remission of sins. Where did this come from? Where did Yeshu ever refer to any of this? I know where he got it from. He obviously got it from reading Paul. I mean, yes, you did read Pauline's epistles, didn't he? Well, let's look at it from a Christian point of view. If yes, you's God or the Son of God, then he knows everything from start to finish. So in heaven, before he ever came down to earth, he read Paul's epistles, even though they weren't written yet. Nonetheless, they would have been in the New Testament, which yes, was above time, could have seen anyway, right? <laughs> I mean, based upon that kind of logic, we could twist and turn anything. No. There is no place for these words in the historical text. Yeshu never echoed such sentiments anywhere that we see in Matthew before. Matthew certainly did not do so. The introduction of these words in this place, like everything else in verse 17 and forward, echoed to us the hand of a later 
non-Jewish redactor who is clearly introducing things in glaring contradiction to, in glaring ignorance of the original Jewish teachings. So what can I say? And he says, But I say to you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day which I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What does that mean? Again, this is so problematic. Let's understand this. I'm not going to drink the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay. In my Father's kingdom. I guess from a certain point of view, that would be heaven. All right? Yeshu comes, and he's going to drink wine in heaven. Drinking wine in heaven? Drinking wine in heaven? You're in a spiritual body. You don't drink wine in heaven. Why would he say that? Does it make sense? When I go to heaven, I'm not planning to drink wine. Not, not Chardonnay, not Nouveau, not anything. I go to heaven, I'm not interested in drinking wine. No other respect. I'm not even interested in having pizza, or beer, or a hamburger. I'm not even a cheeseburger. Sorry. No, we don't do such things in heaven. So, if Yeshu truly said these words, when would he be drinking the fruit of the mind in his father's kingdom? If it's not life after death or heaven, then obviously, like everything else throughout his true words, he would have been speaking about the reconstituted Davidic monarchy here on earth, established by either him or his family. Again, we see an echo here, possibly missed by the later Christian redactor, of Yeshi's political inference saying, I will drink with you when we are accomplished our political military task of insurrection. That is how this makes sense. Now, we move on. When they had sung a hymn, they went to the Man of Olives. They sung a hymn? Again, the Christian redactor would not have understood. What hymn do you sing at the end of a meal? Every Torah observant Jew knows it. What's the name of the hymn? We don't always sing it, but we recite it. Grace after meals. Birkat HaMazon. Do you see how Jewish this all was? And how it is lost in translation? Because ultimately the people who redacted the story didn't know the original Judaic context. So now they're going to go out to Harat Sophim. They're going to go out to the Man of Olives. And Yeshu says, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Wait, 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 wait. Where did all of this come from? All right, he, had this, he mentioned earlier the sign of Jonah and stuff like that. But you see, he clearly has all of this planned. Oh, you can't deny that. Call it the plan of God or the plan of man, whatever. But clearly this is all planned. And yet he says, I'm going to rise and go before you to Galilee. And again, this just does not make any sense. And why? Because later, when we do read about the resurrection, the supposed resurrection, no one expected him to be resurrected. No one expected to see him. Remember, according to the other Gospels, they found the empty tomb, and everybody says, where's his body? He was stolen. No one went and said, oh, look, the tomb is empty. He rose from the dead. Let's go to Galilee and meet him like he said. Uh-uh. So you see, the holes in the story that the redactor apparently left open or wasn't aware of. Put things in there. And that's the problem. Now we go to Peter, his right-hand man. Peter answered and said to him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. Yea, she says, Verily I say that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Okay, interesting story. I'm not going to bother getting into it too much. It says, Peter said to him, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Okay, we'll get into this in a minute. Moving on. 
It says, Yeshu came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Okay. What is he doing? Why is he separating from them? Why can't he pray with his buddies? He says he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Why was he sorrowful and heavy? They said to him, all right, then he said to them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Why is he so sorrowful? Good Lord, I thought this guy is the Son of God. I thought he came down to earth specifically to die so that he can make an atonement for, for the sins of man. Bottom line, you know, if I was God and I came down to earth and I'm about to fulfill the ultimate purpose and goal of existence and creation... I don't know if I would be so sorry full or, or depressed. I'd say, hallelujah, the, the time of fulfillment is upon us. I'd be pretty upbeat about it. Why is he so sorrowful? It betrays something here. It betrays the contradiction of what later, you know, teachings taught about him. First prayer. Since they went a little farther and he fell on his face and prayed, O oh, my father, be it possible that this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will be done. What would happen if God had said, All right, it is possible. You don't have to die. It's okay. Well, from a Christian point of view, he might have been saying, Eh, we don't need to forget the souls of everybody. Oh, what the heck? I created all these souls. I got plenty of room in hell, right? I'm the God. I'm creator. I could just create extra levels in hell. Every soul I create, I create and put them right in hell. Forget about sending them to the earth. Who cares about sending them to the earth? Send them right to hell. Right? Go to hell. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Does any of that make sense? No, of course not. Why would Yeshua, who is supposedly the Savior of mankind, even contemplate this? Do you remember way back at the beginning, when Yeshua was out in the desert, he supposedly faced down the devil? The devil said, bow down and worship me. Right? I'll give you this, I'll give you that. He says, be gone, be gone, be gone. He won against the devil. What's he in a state of depression here? This is indicative of something. Indicative of something very contradictory to what later... Christian theology and dogma wants to present. Moving right along. He comes to his disciples and finds them asleep. Why wouldn't they be asleep? And they said to Peter, What could ye not watch with me an hour? You can't stay awake. What does he need them to stay awake for? What are they watching for? Well, but the priests and everybody else are coming. Okay. But again, if this is your plan to die at their hand, then so be it. What's the problem? Bottom line, if you want to set yourself up to be caught, you don't really need people to be out there watching for your attackers now, do you? It's placing them in unnecessary danger, isn't it? But you see, if indeed Yeshua had concocted this, then he would need his right-hand people not to be in on his secret, but to be, if you will, the transformed believers. So everything had to look right even in their eyes. So therefore, if he is a wanted criminal, a hidden terrorist, then he needs his bodyguards to be on guard for him. Oh no, you don't read it like that? Let's read on and find out. Why else would he need bodyguards? Why else would he be upset if they're sleeping? Watch and pray that ye not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I need you guys on watch. How else am I to be protected? So I went a second time and prayed, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Well, that is it. Turn off your mic. Doesn't belong in his classroom. Silly rabbi. We've just been joined by a fellow rabbi. He always keeps his mic on. He never realizes that he has to mute his own mic. So anyway, moving right along. Here's something so interesting. Again, Yeshu is praying not to have to go through with this plan. Apparently, he himself is having doubts. Now, if you're the Son of God, and you've created the entire heavens and the earth for this purpose, you don't have any doubts. This is describing his humanity. Yeshu the man is having conflict with Yeshu the God? That's a contradiction in 
Christian theology, but certainly clearly understood if we're talking from a Jewish point of view, where indeed you have a human being questioning his mortality and the dangers that he's going to have to face. So, he then came and found them asleep again, because they were tired. Third prayer. And as he left them and he went this way, he prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said, Sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray him. Now, this is interesting. This is the last thing we'll conclude with here. Listen. While he spake, Yehuda, one of the twelve came with him a great multitude with swords and stabs of the chief priests and elders of the people. The secular authorities. Notice no Pharisees here. No Torah authorities. Yehuda, the only one who could have been trusted to do this. And now that he betrayed him, gave him a sign, whomsoever I shall kiss, that be he told him. So listen to this. Forthwith he came to Yeshua and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Yeshua said, Friend, wherefore art thou come? He didn't call him evil one. And they came and they laid hand on Yeshua and took him. Judah, part of the tribe, part of the conspiracy. But now listen to this next. And behold, one of them which were with Yeshua stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Okay? We learn from the other Gospels that this was none less than Peter. Now, here is also clear indication of their zealot military militant orientation. Number one, it's been clear throughout that Peter is a fisherman. Yes? Yes. Question. Have you ever, any of you ever gone fishing? How many of you have ever gone fishing with a sword? How many of you have ever gone out to the river or to the lake, trout fishing and the like, and try to stab fish with the sword? I, I personally have never tried it. I, I don't think that a sword is good for fishing. What then is Peter doing with a sword? Somebody in text is commenting here, saying about spear fishing. A spear isn't the, the sword. Thank you very much. Peter has a sword. Number one, what's he doing with a sword? Number two, as it says, he's rather quick to draw it at the first instant, bam, of danger. And number three, anyone who has martial arts experience, as I do, to be able to chop off the ear of somebody, therefore disqualifying him as a priest, that requires a level of expertise of movement with a sword, the likes of which takes years and years of practice. So I have this fisherman who's armed, clearly violent and able, and quick and expedient. If that is not the identity and definition of an armed and experienced zealot, Sikari assassin. I don't know what it is. So again, we clearly see the violent nature of Yeshu's own students, his Talmudim. They are clearly not the innocent type, but ultimately they are of a different breed. And that is what we will conclude with as we continue in this most disturbing story which is clearly uneven, with so many historical inaccuracies and problems, the likes of which are clearly recorded throughout Christian scholarship. And I would encourage you, Jew, Christian, anyone alike, who's interested in this material, please review, research the material. We will go into the works of Brandon, specifically and I'll read to you in future classes from his trial of Jesus of Nazareth. We'll go into the Passover plot. We're going to go into some other works of Charlesworth. These are all Christian scholars. So that we can understand the nature of these things which are so glaringly obvious, even in the hands of Christian scholars. So from our Orthodox Jewish point of view, we can complement that 
and try to come to a better understanding so as to distinguish between myth and reality, history and faith, or religion, if you will. So on that note, let's conclude this class for tonight. Again, thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Ariel Bartzadok. Come see me online at koshatora.com. God bless. Good night. Shalom.